I'm so glad to have you with us today on Today with Marilyn and Sarah. This is absolutely going to be one of the best programs you'll watch. So I want you to stay with me. And you know, we've got some really awesome things that are happening in our program this week. This is Holy Week. But I know that you also have very, very specific and probably some very significant needs in your life. And we want to pray for you and be a part of God reaching in and helping you, encouraging you, blessing you, prospering you, and giving you answers that he has for you. So whatever the need is in your life, please make sure that you pick up the phone and call right now. Or if you can't get to the phone, you can visit our website and leave a prayer request there. But this is what we consider Holy Week. And this is when we celebrate the, the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you that specifically in this week that you let Jesus uh, become more integrated into your life, more alive, more connected and involved and fused into your life, not just from a religious or a traditional mindset, but from a daily, practical, hands-on, 24-7 mindset. So I encourage you to pick up the phone and call. Let us pray for you. We love to pray. If you can't get to the phone, then leave a prayer request on our website. And you know, what we're doing today is we're continuing our series. We started yesterday, and we talked about Jesus and what happens in Holy Week. Yesterday, we talked about how Jesus was fully God as though he were not man, and how he is fully man as though he were not God, his humanity. We started and talked about the carpenter and how he was a carpenter by trade, by craft, and that he was the master builder and did amazing, incredible things, how he continues to be the master builder in our lives even to this day. And as we continued on, we came to our next room, our next scene, and we saw that this was where Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples. And it was a very powerful experience for his disciples. And Jesus was anticipated this Last Supper. There was an anticipation, an eagerness uh, to have this last fellowship communion time with his disciples. But we also remember that it wasn't just where he did the communion, we received communion, but also this is where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples and also where uh, Judas was identified as the one who betrayed him. And Peter, it was predicted that Peter would deny Christ. So we see this progression uh, of this Holy Week and, and it's a very powerful expression and helps you have some tangible hands-on connection with what Jesus went through as well as his disciples who were with him. And today I'm very excited because we're going to be joining Jesus, if you will, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is a very powerful experience for Christ. And this is, if you recall this, this is where he took some of his best, most, I shouldn't say best, some of his most intimate disciples, the ones he was most connected to and probably in deepest relationship. He took them with him into the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter, James, and John. And he told them, stay here. This is in Matthew 26, I believe from 36 to 46. He said, stay here. And Jesus went off to the side. And we see that there's a conversation that happens between Jesus and the Father. And I think this is very interesting. When I was reading this and kind of studying it out, this was very powerful for me. Because when you read this, Jesus says to his disciples, stay here and watch with me. And interestingly enough, uh, as I was kind of meditating and, and pondering this, Jesus was always rescuing his disciples, always helping them, always kind of bail them out. You know, you got Peter, you know, sinking when he's trying to walk on the water and Jesus rescues him. You, you have Jesus encouraging his disciples and you always see Jesus giving and always encouraging, doing something, rescuing them, actively putting into them. But this is one of the very few times, I think possibly the only time you see Jesus ask them, to do something to help him. He says, watch and pray. Stay with me. I need you to be around. Jesus didn't go into the Garden of Gethsemane by himself. He didn't try and, and shoulder that burden and the weight of sin that he would carry and that hardship and the anguish and the, the I don't know, the anticipation of what he was going to go through. He didn't try and shoulder that by himself. He wanted his closest buddies, his disciples, with him. And I want to encourage you, I think it's a great illustration of what Jesus did for us, but also asks us to do as well. 
that we don't try and shoulder life alone, the hardships, the difficulties, the struggles that we face, that we don't try and go through them alone, but that we have community around us, that we have people that are Christians that can encourage us, that can pray for us, that can be a part, that can say, you're going to make it, that can uh, hold you up and, and support you, that Jesus asks us by his own, his own uh, example, asks us to do the same, that we let people come around us. And that's not popular in America. In America, we're taught to be independent and self-sufficient and a self-made man. I don't need anybody. But the truth of it is, even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane asked his closest friends to come and be a part of what he was going through, the hardship that he was anticipating. And maybe you're the independent type. Maybe you're just the, you know, I can do it by myself and self-made and all that. Maybe this is something for you, an eye-opening experience that, wow, I'm not created just to be independent and disconnected, detached from the world around me. I'm, can, I'm created to be in community, in concert with, a, with Christians and, and with the church around me. And maybe that's a new thing for you. I know for myself that's one of the things God's been dealing with me over this last year, that, Sarah, you're too independent. You're too isolated. You're disconnected. I didn't create you to be that way. I created you to have community, to have fellowship, to have friends friendships, to have people come alongside with you in the, in the journey that you take, that I have for you. And so I want to encourage you, why don't you pick up the phone and say, pray for me that I would not be so isolated. Pray for me that I would not be so independent, that I would not be so disconnected, but that I would embrace and have fellowship, communion. And you know, Jesus did that as our example, and he asked us to do the same. But not only did he tell his disciples, watch and pray, it says that Jesus went a little bit further and went and spoke to his father. And he said, Father, take this cup. If, it, if there's anything you can do, Father, take this cup. Remove this from me, please. I don't want to have to face what I'm going to go through. But <laughs> nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And that is one of the most powerful things I think that we read from Jesus when he says, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus had things in front of him that he knew he, would, he was going to face that would be extremely difficult, very hard, absolutely the most difficult thing of his entire life in front of him. And ask God, please take this cup away from me. Please, I don't want to have to go through this. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And I think that's equally true for us today. Jesus models for us that no matter where he leads us, that at the end of this story, we always say, not my will, but yours be done. Father, my life is not about me. My life is about serving you. My life is about honoring you. My life is about surrendering to you. That I bow my knee. Jesus bowed his knee. That I bow my knee to you, Father. May your will be done in my life, not mine, but your will. And Jesus, it says that he sweat blood, that this was not just something that it was kind of an accidental, oh, you know, casual, oh, you know, you do what you want to do, life goes on. This was a very anguishing moment for Christ. Not my will, but yours be done. And in the middle of this having a hard time and this hardship and difficulty and, and anticipating the anguish that was coming, he goes back and he says to his disciples, he finds them and he says, they're sleeping. Why are you sleeping? This is not the time to sleep. And he tells Peter, can you not watch and pray for one hour? And he wakes them up and stirs them up. And these poor guys, they're tired. And he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And if you watch this, Jesus does these things three times. He says to his father, not my will, but yours be done. He goes back and checks on his disciples. Wake up. Wake up. There's bad things coming. You need to watch and pray that you won't be tempted. You won't give in to temptation. Can't you just wake up for one hour and pray? Stay awake, please. Stay with me. And I think this is a perfect, perfect illustration of Christ's persistence and endurance that he said, look, I'm going to go through this. I don't want to. This is hard. This is difficult. It's the last thing in the world I want to do. But it's also a great contrast because it also shows the humanity of the disciples and our humanity. How many times have I tried myself, you know, to I'm going to persevere, I'm going to be diligent, I'm going to be faithful, and then I wind up falling short. I don't do everything I said I would do. Maybe I said I was going to fast for a week and I wound up fasting for five days. Maybe I said I was going to pray for an hour and 15 minutes went by and I thought, oh, <laughs> 
I can't make it for an hour. It's, it's so, so much of our humanity rests in, in sometimes the flesh controlling us. But just like Jesus said, watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. And Jesus with, uh, contrasts our weakness with his persistence, our inability with his overwhelming ability. And yet Jesus, in the middle of a difficult time, shows us that through him we can overcome, through him that we can come through dark times. And, you know, Jesus may ask you to go through a garden of Gethsemane, if you will, symbolically. Maybe he asks you to go through a difficult time, a time of tremendous anguish, a time of tremendous hardship, a time of tremendous difficulty. Maybe he asks you to do that. But I challenge you, if he does, when he does, because more often than not, it's when and not if. When he does, I challenge you to have the same reaction that Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. A surrendering of the will. And if you can do that ahead of time in the Garden of Gethsemane, before, the, before all the hardship, before all the difficulty, then it helps you understand, it helps you have the mindset that my life is surrendered, that Jesus is my king. He calls the shots. He's my Lord. I don't just say it in, in word, but I do it in deed and in the attitude of my heart. Maybe you're struggling today, having a hard time surrendering to Jesus. Maybe you feel like, Jesus, take this cup away, and you want to throw the cup at God and say, forget it, and throw the talent. And God is speaking to you today saying, please, surrender to my will. Pick up the phone and call. We want to pray for you that God would help you to surrender to his will, that you could say with Christ, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I will do what you ask me to do. I will be who you ask me to be. I will have the attitude, the behavior. Father, not my will, but yours be done in my life today and ongoingly. Follow the path Jesus took during his final days here on earth on his way to making the ultimate sacrifice, giving his life for us. Go back in time on a special on location set as Sarah teaches at different significant places that Jesus experienced on the way to the cross. This teaching will show in vivid lifelike reality Jesus' love, forgiveness, and the true meaning of Easter, his victory over death and the grave. This four-message teaching on the crucifixion is an experience the whole family will never forget. Along with this powerful DVD, you will receive Crown of Thorns, an original signed lithograph from renowned artist Alan Polt. This stunning piece of artwork is a vivid reminder of the hope we have in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice he made for us all. This print will make a dramatic impact in your home or office. Receive the DVD with four teachings and the signed lithograph for your gift of $49 or more. Call or click to receive this very special offer. just finished talking about the Garden of Gethsemane and how powerful that is when we think about surrendering to God and saying, not my will, but yours be done. But it, similar, around the same timing that we see the Garden of Gethsemane, we also have here uh, Judas coming with the chief priests, coming with the soldiers to betray Christ. And and in the Garden of Gethsemane, this is where Judas comes and, and kisses Jesus. And Jesus says, betray you the Son of God with a kiss, Son of Man with a kiss. But, you know, I want us to back it up a little bit because Judas didn't just suddenly leave from the Last Supper to go out and betray Christ. He actually had done this 
several days before. In fact, when you read about this, and I was setting this out, in John 12, verses 4 to 8, what happened was this. Mary came and anointed Jesus, you know, the, the uh, box of, of perfume, the uh, ointment that was so expensive. She broke it open and anointed Jesus. And Judas said, why wasn't this ointment, this, this extremely expensive perfume, why wasn't it sold and the money given to the poor? And it says that Judas didn't ask this question because he cared about the poor, but because Judas was in charge of the money, that he wanted to help himself to the money. And so from that point on, it says that Judas left from there. And you read about this in, in Mark 14, verses 6 to 10. Judas left, and that's the time that he made the decision to betray Christ. Because from there, when he heard what Jesus said, he's like, fine, if, it's not, if I'm not going to have, this is his thinking, if I cannot have access to more money, because I'm stealing already from, the, from all the money that we, we, we receive. I'm already stealing. If I can't get more, then what I'll do is I'll betray him and get the money someplace else. And so he leaves from that moment and goes to the chief priests and says to them, I will give you Jesus. How much will you pay me for him? How much will you pay me for Jesus Christ, for me to betray him and give him into your hands? And this... I think is one of the most powerful things that we can consider when we talk about betraying Christ. Because I think in every single one of us, there are things that are so important to us that if we're not careful, we will betray Christ for those things. Now, that's not always going to be money, although money is very common. Remember that Judas took 30 pieces of silver, 30 silver coins. We have these as great illustrations, examples. That was Judas' weak spot, was the money, the coins. But I think, just like you and me, we all have weak spots, things that are extremely important to us, very, very valuable to us, almost to the point where we would betray Christ. Maybe it's not money. Maybe it is money. I know in America that money is an extremely important thing, and people do all kinds of things for money. But sometimes it's not about the money. Maybe it's about a relationship. I know for me, in my 20s, I was, I was good at codependent relationships. And those were my weak spot. I would betray, I would betray Christ for, for those codependent relationships. They were very unhealthy. Very unhealthy, ungodly. Absolutely. Maybe that's not it for you. Maybe it's power for you. That no matter what, you want power. And you would give anything, even betray your relationship with Christ for power. You know, I want to encourage you that that's not, there's nothing more valuable in your life than Jesus Christ. Maybe you're watching today and maybe you have betrayed Jesus. Maybe you have gone out and you said, oh, you know, that relationship. Maybe you were like me with the codependent. Maybe there's an addiction in your life that has more power over you and you would do anything for that addiction, even betray Christ. Maybe it's the money. Maybe you're like Judas and it was the money that got to you. But all of us have those weak spots where we, we might, when pushed, we might actually betray Christ for that weak spot. If you've struggled with that, why don't you pick up the phone and call right now and say, pray for me. Pray for me that this weakness would not be overwhelming, overpowering to me that I would betray Christ. Pray for me that this codependent relationship, maybe it's the money, maybe it's the power, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your, your marriage. There are all kinds of things that are very important to us that can get out of balance and cause us to betray Christ. Pick up the phone and call. We want to pray for you that God would help you to overcome those things, that they wouldn't be the stumbling block, the weak spot that Judas uh, experienced, but rather that God would have victory and help you have victory over that area of your life. Because we see with Judas, and here you need to understand this, Judas, when he betrayed Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had already thought through, he had already entertained the idea in his mind. And the betraying of Christ, where we think something is more important than Christ, doesn't just suddenly happen. This is a thought pattern that we entertain and, and we let these things start to take root and start to take foundation where we, we like a person. There's a codependent attachment there that, oh, you know, we'll kind of wane on our Bible reading just to check in with them. 
or maybe we'll not go to church this Sunday because I need to work extra so I can get this extra amount of money. And there are all kinds of ways where we can, small in small ways, and we justify it, but in small ways, we kind of compromise. Compromise our relationship and say, well, you know, this is, and maybe sometimes I think it's our own entertainment. There are lots of ways that we compromise and make something more important than Jesus Christ. Be that money, be that entertainment, be that even ourselves. We think uh, things are more important for us than, than our life in Christ. But no matter what it is, there's nothing more valuable than Jesus Christ. And we see this with Judas. He took the 30 pieces of silver and you, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he betrayed Christ. And after he did that, he felt awful. He felt horrible. He took the money back to the chief priests. He says, I don't want your money. I did wrong. This is wrong what you're doing to Jesus. You need to let him go. You need to, I'll give you the money back. Let him go. And the chief priest said, forget it. We're not doing this. And in fact, need to, this is something real interesting. You realize that 30 pieces of silver at that time in history was the cost of a common slave. That's how much a person would pay to buy a common slave. And so the chief priests were like, yeah, that's a bargain. That's a discount. And, and Judas said to them, no, I don't, want, I don't want to do this. I want to go back on our agreement. Turn Jesus loose and I'll give you the money back. And the chief priest said, no, we're not doing that. You keep your money. He said, I'm not keeping it. And he throws the money at their feet and runs out. And when he runs out, he feels so awful, so miserable. He's betrayed Jesus Christ that the Bible tells us he goes out and he hangs himself. He hangs himself. Think of the guilt. Think of the, the torture in his heart. Awful. Awful what happens to Judas. And Jesus knew. He said, this is a terrible position that this guy was put in. Awful that he would betray me and the hardship, the difficulty, the mental the anguish, the torture that he went through. And you know, maybe you're watching today and you have betrayed Christ and you feel awful. I remember there was a time in my life when I turned my back on Christ and then I felt absolutely miserable. I remember when I came back to Christ, I felt so awful. I said, how could you ever receive me? I betrayed you. I turned my back on you. I deny, I did worse than deny. I, I sold you out, Jesus. I feel terrible. And yet he forgave me. Maybe you're watching today and you've betrayed Christ and you want to start a fresh relationship with Jesus. You don't want to hang like Judas and live in that torture and that hardship, that difficulty, that anguish, but you want to live in the freedom and have that restored fellowship, communion with Jesus Christ. Why don't you pick up the phone and call right now? We want to pray for you. And you, we want to pray with you that you would have a brand new restored relationship with Jesus Christ. Great thing about Jesus is he does do-overs. <laughs> he gives second chances. He's the God of second chance. So pick up the phone and call right now. And I want to encourage you, tomorrow we're going to continue our journey to the cross with Jesus. Yesterday, we did some powerful things with the Last Supper. Today, we talked about the Garden of Gethsemane and Judas betrayal. Tomorrow, you don't want to miss it. Tomorrow is going to be extremely, extremely impacting to you. So I want to encourage you that you watch tomorrow. And in this Holy Week, don't forget, set aside some time for some communion. Set aside some time for reflection. Set aside some time the busyness of life and, and take a little moment to pause and reflect and let this journey to the cross, not just be the journey that you watch with Jesus, but that we take with Jesus and that we grow in our depth, in our communion, in our fellowship, in our intimacy. And tomorrow is going to be incredibly powerful. This is our journey to the cross for Jesus' resurrection. Follow the path Jesus took during his final days here on earth on his way to making the ultimate sacrifice, giving his life for us. Go back in time on a special on location set as Sarah teaches at different significant places that Jesus experienced on the way to the cross. This teaching will show in vivid lifelike reality Jesus' love, forgiveness, and the true meaning of Easter, his victory over death and the grave. This four-message teaching on the crucifixion is an experience the whole family will never forget. Along with this powerful DVD, you will receive Crown of Thorns, an original signed lithograph from renowned artist Alan Polt. 
This stunning piece of artwork is a vivid reminder of the hope we have in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice He made for us all. This print will make a dramatic impact in your home or office. Receive the DVD with four teachings and the signed lithograph for your gift of $49 or more. Call or click to receive this very special offer. You need to go to Johannesburg, South Africa with Sarah and me for the most blessed time of your life to minister. It will be so awesome and you can get your brochure today. Is that right? That's right. Call or get on the website for the information. And we have an additional opportunity, yes. Mom, uh, for an excursion to Cape Town to see a safari as well as Robbins Island where Nelson Mandela was. Um, absolutely amazing things that are in Cape Town, that's an additional excursion. But the primary thing we want to encourage you with here is our ministry opportunities in Johannesburg. We're going to be ministering at nighttime as well as a Saving Moses opportunity. This is a life-changing trip and you don't want to miss out. Mom, how can they come? They can come and get the brochure, but you could also scholarship someone to go and a group of you could get together and scholarship your pastor and totally bless him and change his life. We want to hear from you today. Did you know that one prayer can change your life forever? You say one prayer. Yes, one prayer. When I was 16 years old, I prayed one prayer that is still changing my life. I'm in my 70s, and not only is it changing my life daily and has for all these years, but I have eternal life because of that one prayer. Oh, that prayer transforms everything. You say, well, what is the prayer? And I'll tell you what it is. I invited Jesus to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I repented of my sins. And he came into my heart and he's never left me. And he will never leave you either because the Bible says, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you eternal life. Are you ready to pray that prayer? Maybe you've never prayed it. Maybe you've prayed it, but your life is out of sync. Hey, you can pray and recommit your life to him. Pray with me right now. Mean this with your heart. Say, Father, I believe you love me. You have a wonderful plan for my life. I am sorry for my sins and the wrong things I have done. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. I have faith in his blood. Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Did you pray that prayer? Your life is changed and transformed. You will never be the same. Did you recommit your life? Expect transformation. And above all, know that your name is written in heaven and not in hell.